Hi everyone, I'm one of the TAs, Nicole, in case we haven't met during office hours or one of the review sessions. And I will be giving this video lecture because the main topic is histones and how they're modified, which is what I'm actually doing my PhD research on. So in the previous video, Dr. Monfred introduced the fact that DNA wraps around proteins called histones and that this affects gene accessibility and therefore expression because if a gene is not in a position that the transcription machinery can see and read, that gene won't get expressed. So that leaves us to wonder, how does the cell regulate DNA wrapping around histones? And how does it make some genes accessible and expressed while others are inaccessible and silenced? So altering how DNA wraps around histones, together known as chromatin, is a process called chromatin remodeling. And there are two different ways to do this. The first is through a group of proteins called the SWI-SNF complex. And the SWI-SNF complex is made up of a number of proteins and they actually physically move histone octamers along the DNA in order to expose different DNA segments and make them accessible. And they do this by using the energy of ATP. So we're not going to cover the actual like chemical reaction that takes place, um, but do know, so from this diagram, um, that the Swyzdiv complex is responsible for physically moving the nucleosomes. So to kind of show you guys how that works, we have our DNA here in blue that is wrapped around our purple uh, histone octamer. And in this blue segment of DNA, there's this yellow segment that um, is actually even a little hard to see, and this red segment. And both of them um, are kind of hidden from the transcription machinery because of how they are wrapped around the histone protein. They're not really accessible at all. But then the SWI-SNF complex can come through and actually causes the nucleosome to move along the DNA. So kind of see how everything here sort of shifted. And now this red segment is exposed. So now activators, transcription factors, and other, all the other transcription machinery can actually come and bind to this segment of DNA and results in it being expressed because now it's actually visible to the cell in a sense. And now this diagram, it's kind of showing the same thing, but just more zoomed out because in the last, um, last figure, it was focused in on a single nucleosome. Whereas here, we're kind of more zoomed out and we can see a longer stretch of DNA and see how densely packed it is with histones. So the DNA is in red and the histones are in yellow. And on the left, if you look closely, you can see that we have a tata box. So it's here uh, highlighted in, or kind of coated in this sort of teal color. And if you remember, the tata box is our promoter and it's buried within these nucleosomes. So there isn't really space for the transcription machinery to interact with it. But then we also have this activator protein that kind of looks like a little gaming piece. Um, bound to the DNA. And that activator protein is what signals the chromatin remodeling complex or SWI-SNF to come in and physically start moving nucleosomes around so that the Tata box is now exposed. And now that it is accessible, the genes here can actually get expressed. So like I said before, there are two ways to remodel chromatin. So the first is the swi sniff complex and it kind of involves physically moving the DNA around or the nucleosomes around, sorry, that are bound to the DNA. And the second is through the post-translational modifications of histone proteins. Now there are four core histone proteins, H2A, H two B H three, which is the protein that I specifically work on, and H four, and all four of these are really highly conserved in eukaryotes. So we, you can see them from 
yeast all the way up to humans. And as it turns out, a lot of the foundational work of H3, which is my favorite of the histone proteins, was actually done in Drosophila. So all of those um, kind of genetic experiments that we talked about um, previously in the course, Drosophila were used for that, as well as kind of setting up a lot of foundational knowledge about histone H3. So post-translational modifications or PTMs are added to the histone tails. And the histone tails are correspond to the end terminus or the amino ends of the histone proteins. And the end terminus also then corresponds to the five prime end of the mRNA from which they are translated from. And so these tails can then interact with the DNA sequence, um, which we'll discuss um, in just a little bit. And they are very basic. So the histones are very positively charged and they have a lot of lysines and arginines. And there are also a lot of different possibilities and combinations of post-translational modifications that we can have. So currently there are known to be about 150 uh, PTMs that can take place on these tails, which does kind of help explain why there's so much variability in gene expression, because there's so many different ways to go about it. Now, kind of getting into those histone tails, this is an image that Dr. Monfred showed in one of the previous videos, but I kind of wanted to bring it back up again to specifically point out where the histone tails are in relation to everything else. And I think this will kind of help make some more things a little bit more clear as we move forward. So here we have our DNA, which is in kind of like the green and the brown. And it's wrapped around the eight histone proteins, which are kind of these ribbons. So these are like alpha helices here for anyone who's kind of taken biochemistry. You know, these are alpha helices. Um, that's not important for this class. Um, but in yellow here, they're kind of pointing to this stringy structure that is sticking out of the DNA the, or the DNA histone complex. And this sort of stringy structure that these arrows are pointing to, those are the histone tails. So what's important here is that the histone tails are not concealed by the DNA. They're not in this kind of mess of protein happening here. They're actually kind of sticking out in space. And that's important because then they're not concealed by the DNA like the rest of the histone protein, and that's why they can get modified. That's the whole kind of like physical basis for why they can be modified is they are actually exposed and out in space so the other proteins that modify them can see them, and this leads to changes in gene expression. So now here we have come back to more of our cartoon diagrams, we have the DNA in blue wrapped around our purple histones, and now we have the tails drawn in, whereas in a couple of the previous diagrams we didn't. And now if we zoom in really closely, so let's say we're zeroing in on this nucleosome in particular, we zoom in and we see that all of our different amino acids are on the tails, and you can see a couple of different things. So one is that attached to a lot of these amino acids, most of which are lysines, you can see that there are either A's or M's. Now, A's correspond to acetyl groups and M's correspond to methyl groups. And we're gonna get into these more in just a second, but they are key post-translational modifications for histones. And to all of these A's and M's are attached to lysines, which I mentioned before, the histone tails are really basic. So they have a lot of lysines and they are actually the most commonly, uh, commonly modified amino acid in the histone tails. So now we're gonna get more into more specifics about these PTMs, like what they are, what they're doing, and so there are three different ones that we will focus on for this class. So the first is acetylation. So which if you've taken organ organic chemistry, this structure may look a little bit familiar. Don't worry for this class if you maybe haven't taken OCHEM or it's been a while, you don't need to have this structure memorized. So all to know 
is that this chemical group, what's special about it is it actually helps to neutralize the positive charge of the lysine. And we'll kind of cover more in just a little bit why that's so important. But just so keep that in the back of your mind that lysine is very positively charged and this acetyl group kind of helps to neutralize that charge. And the next post-translational post modification is a methylation, so it's just a CH3 um, that gets added on. And then we also have phosphorylation. And phosphorylation happens a lot in cell biology. It's a really common post-translational modification, even outside of histones. So if you take um, either MCB121 or BIS104, you'll learn a lot more about phosphorylation and the role that it plays. Um, but so phosphorylation involves adding a phosphate to either a serine, threonine, or tyrosine. Um, so that's where phosphorylation comes in, but for the purposes of this course, we're going to mostly focus on acetylation and methylation, because they are kind of the more, they're the most well-studied post-translational modifications. We kind of know the most about them, whereas phosphorylation, we know a lot about it, but sometimes where it's added, it's, it, is, it can be very unclear what, what it's doing, like what its purpose is whereas acetylation and methylation is much more understood. I mentioned earlier that acetylation neutralizes the positive charge on lysines. And that's really important because DNA is negatively charged. So altering the charge on what would normally be a positively charged histone changes how histones and DNA interact. So for example, when you add an acetyl group or make it hyperacetylated and neutralize the lysine, the DNA and the histones then don't interact nearly as strong, strongly as they did before. So the chromatin then begins to open up and is considered active. This can then result in transcription being turned on and it is now considered euchromatin. So if TNA is nice and open, we call it euchromatin. On the other hand, when the positive charges on the histone proteins are left unmodified, so there's no acetyl group or the acetyl group is removed, we are now hypoacetylated, and the negative charges of the DNA and the positive charges of the histone continue to bring the two closer together. So kind of think like magnets, the two opposite charges uh, attract and kind of bring it together really closely. And this makes the DNA more compact and more difficult to access. And because it's more difficult to access this stretch of chromatin, it is considered inactive or closed and transcription is turned off. And these regions are called heterochromatin. And some examples that we've that we've already talked about in class that of heterochromatin include centromeres and telomeres. Now, normally you will see histones and their modifications written like this. So first you'll have whatever the histone protein is. In this example, it is H3, followed by the amino acid, and it's always the single letter code. So in this case, it's K for lysine and the position that it is. So in this case, it's 27. So it's the 27th amino acid. And then the modification that was added is last. So in this case, that is acetylation. And now we have two types of proteins that help balance out the level of acetylation because you don't want all of your histone proteins acetylated to get all of your genes transcribed. Um, for a lot of reasons that sometimes like you just don't need that particular gene on. Sometimes these are genes that they're on in the wrong context or on too much, they can lead to cancer. So this is a really delicate balance that the cells have to strike. And so this, these two proteins that are some of the players in keeping this balance are histone deacetylases or HDACs and histone acetyltransferase or HATs. So HDACs will remove the acetyl group. So you see here we have H3K27 
and after the HDAC comes in is now just an H3K27, no acetylation. And this will make everything more compact because now it is hypoacetylated. Well, hats are responsible for adding an acetyl group. So, so for example, it would go from H3K27 to H3K27 acetyl. And this will make the chromatin more open and you're, more, you're going to get more transcription of whatever gene it is. And so just a real quick tidbit, because this is, again, kind of a little bit more aligned with the work that I do. HDACs in recent years um, have kind of been looked at more closely, and there have been some drugs developed that are called HDAC inhibitors. So they actually prevent this process, the removal of the acetyl group, and they've been approved by the FDA for treat treatments of some cancers. Now, there are some issues of developing resistance to these drugs, so they're still by no means perfect, um, but it is an example of the importance of histones and their modifications in disease. And so now this is just a really nice illustration kind of summing up the last slide. So at the top, you have really densely packed chromatin, and it's our heterochromatin. And if we follow the arrows um, going down, you see that it's histone acetylation. And after the histone acetylation, the chromatin is much more open. So it's not this super densely packed thing. It's actually kind of opened up and there's some stretches of DNA that theoretically some transcription machinery could actually see and access. And now it is more like euchromatin. And then going back the other way, if we kind of take all these acetyl groups off, we're back to our very closed conformation again. Now, moving on to methylation, which I said is one of the other really common post-translational modifications. It is a little bit more complicated than acetylation um, in that it can either turn transcription on or off. And it really depends on which histone residue the methyl group is being added to. So one example is H3K4 trimethyl. And so it has three methyl groups added to it. And that is usually what happens with methyl groups. We usually kind of add, add one on at a time until we get to three. Um, and it is normally found at active promoters. So promoters that are kind of signaling that the gene needs to be transcribed. And conversely, there is H3K27 trimethyl, which is actually a repressive mark. And it will help close off the chromatin and turn off transcription. So this is an example of that mark working in two different ways, depending on which lysine is being added to. And so this is a really good visual representation kind of summarizing the addition of methyl and acetyl groups and how the balance of these two marks can result in either compact, compact chromatin, heterochromatin like we see here, or open euchromatin. And this is what gives us the histone code. So similar to the genetic code, there are specific combinations of histones and histone marks, which will determine if a section of chromatin is open or closed. And uh, real quick, just as I had mentioned it yet, all of these chemical groups that are added to histones are added covalently. So these aren't ionic or hydrogen bonds, these are covalent bonds. So let's kind of do a practice problem. So applying, practice problem applying these concepts. So it says here that chromatin regions with histone hyperacetylation would be expected to have, and you have a bunch of different options here. So if you want to take a second to kind of work through it and see with what we've covered so far, um, what you think the answer is, um, go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll kind of come back and work through it. Okay, so let's first take note of the keyword here, hyperacetylation. So if there is hyperacetylation, that means that acetylation has increased. So I'm just gonna kind of make a note here. So 
increase in acetyl, which I'm shortening as AC. And if there is more acetylation, then the chromatin will not be densely packed. So that rules out A and B, because they both say that there will be densely packed nucleosomes. And acetylation does the opposite. It makes chromatin more open. So because we ruled out A and B, we can also rule out E, which is both B and C, since we've determined that B is not correct. So now we're left with either C or D. Now they both say that the nucleosomes will be loosely packed. So, so far they're both still viable options. So C says that they will be loosely packed nucleosomes in low transcription activity. D says they are loosely packed nucleosomes and will have high transcription activity. Now, since acetylation is our more straightforward PTM, unlike methylation, which it could mean either increased or decreased um, transcription, acetylation is more straightforward and it will always result in increased transcription. So that means our answer has to be D because it is correctly saying that the nucleosomes would be loosely packed and that transcription would be increased or transcription activity would be high. And so we focused really heavily on the PTMs, but I kind of want to show you this figure to tie everything together. So we have our two different, um, two different chromatin remodeling processes that we discussed, which were SWI sniff over here and are histone modifications. Now, you don't need to know every step that is happening in this diagram here. More what I want you to walk away with from this picture is that gene expression happens through a combination of chemical modifications. So that would be with like R hats, H ducts, adding methyl groups, getting rid of methyl groups, and SWI sniff helping to physically move nucleosomes around and make space for transcription machinery. So it's not an either or situation. It's not that you're only going to have SWI sniff in place or you're only going to have histone modifications. So it's both of them working together to modify gene expressions. Now this diagram just really rounds out histone tail modifications because unlike the other diagrams we saw earlier, it shows that some of the residues can be modified in multiple ways. So we have a few examples here with this lysine and this lysine and several here in histone H3 and then a couple here in histone H4. And so the long line that has all the amino acid letters are shown, those are the histone tails, which makes sense because we said before that's where the majority of modification is taking place. And this kind of like 3D prism pizza slice looking thing is our histone core. So that is the part of part of the histone that the DNA wraps around like in that x-ray crystal structure we saw earlier. Now almost all the residues that can be modified are on the tails. There's really just a couple of exceptions here in histone H3. And some of these residues have different options for how they can be modified. Some of these residues can either be methylated or acetylated depending on the cell type the stage of development the cell is at, or which gene it is associated with, and if it needs to be expressed or not. Now I just want to take just a minute to focus on this residue, H3K27, which I know we kind of were using before in examples earlier, and it is because this residue is very near and dear to my heart because it can either be methylated or acetylated, and it is commonly mutated in pediatric brain cancer. And that is more, even more specifically what I'm working on. So to kind of walk through why this lysine 27 is so important and the consequences of mutating it, I've included this figure uh, from a, a paper that my lab published earlier this year. And so what we have written here at the top is the amino acids for the histone tail and K27 is highlighted here in blue. 
And there's a very specific point mutation, which if you remember from last week's videos, is just one nucleotide change in the DNA that causes this lysine to change from a lysine to a methionine, which is written here as K27M. So for histones, we always write the original or wild type amino acid first, so K for lysine, the position, and then what is written last is what it was mutated to, so in this case, methionine. And so for this specific mutation I study, it's written as K27M, and it's found in 70% of, uh, of a subset of childhood brain cancers called DIPG and 14% of glioblastoma. So it's really important for this particular disease. And it's because when this lysine is replaced by methionine, it can't be modified at all. So remember how we mentioned before that you know, the histone tails are really basic. They have a lot of lysines and arginines, and they can tend to be the ones, especially lysines, that are really heavily modified. And phosphorylation can happen on some different residues, but methionine isn't one of them. And methionine can't have acetyl groups or methyl groups added to it. And K27, as it turns out, is a really key residue to regulate which genes get expressed in which ones get silenced, either by the addition of acetyl groups um, or methyl groups. So the acetyl group being the activating mark and the methyl group being the silencing mark. So without the wild type of this key residue, we see a lot of genes that are associated with uh, cancer actually get turned on because the silencing methyl mark is no longer around and it can't be added to this new methyl group. And so I just wanted to go through this, not only to share with you a little bit about my graduate research, because uh, it's fi fun to share with people who maybe haven't heard about it before, um, but to also provide some more concrete examples of how all this microscopic cellular machinery and regulation we learn about um, actually has some really very real implication and impacts on human health and disease. So this is a really real life application to kind of all this molecular stuff we've been learning about. And so then this last slide is just a really nice summary of the histone code and how post-translational modifications affect chromatin stability, condensation, which we talked about in the last video, and accessibility of DNA to transcription machinery, which was the focus of this video. And these marks are actually heritable, so they can be passed on through generations. And this is why we have the name epigenetics, epi meaning above, like we learned from epistasis. So you get above genetics. It's an additional layer that affects which genes are expressed and to what degree. So thanks guys for watching. I'm glad I got to kind of give you guys a lecture and um, tell you more about what I do. Um, so if you have any more, if you have any questions about either just strictly the material from this lecture, or if you want to learn more about my work and more of what I do with my research on these systems, like come to office hours, post in Piazza, I'd love to tell you guys more about it. Thanks.